Welcome back everyone. Today we start our capstone unit on climate change, where we're really going to, to explore the culmination of everything that we've learned so far in environmental economics. And we're gonna start with just a cursory overview of the science behind climate change. We start with greenhouse gases, which can be carbon dioxide, it can be water vapor, it can be methane, it can be ozone, it can be hydrocarbons, it can be black carbon like soot, it can be nitrogen compounds. We start with all these greenhouse gases somehow getting emitted into the atmosphere. We'll talk about the sources of these emissions later. But what happens from these emissions is the atmosphere becomes thickened and it traps energy. This is what's known as the greenhouse effect. But it's a little more nuanced than this because there's a dynamic component. The atmosphere becomes more and more thick and in essence traps more and more energy. As a result, the climate changes and it changes in lots of different ways. We might, for instance, see the temperature go up. This is why you sometimes hear it referred to as global warming. These temperature patterns have effects into and of themselves, including melting sea ice and raising sea levels. On top of that, we see the climate change in other ways as well, like shifting rain patterns, increase in the variance to, to what we observe with weather patterns and climate patterns, like uh, rain levels and temperature levels. We also see things like more frequent and stronger storms, we might see carbon dissolve into the ocean and the oceans become more and more acidic. And taken together, all these things might change ecosystems and change a species' ability to survive and thrive. Um, some people, some things, some entities are, are slightly better off, many are worse off, but, but the thing of all this is that people in general are harmed. And we'll talk about this, this more later, but remember, in this class, we talk about the environment from an anthropocentric point of view, meaning people are at the center of all of this. So that was a quick overview of the science behind climate change. But as economists, we're interested in some of the key features of greenhouse gases as pollutants that might determine our best courses of action. So, so what do we know about greenhouse gases as pollutants? Well, they tend to be more uniformly mixed, meaning that for, for climate effects, it doesn't really matter where a greenhouse gas is emitted, we see the same effect on the climate. What does this mean in terms of potential policy? It means that climate change is a transboundary problem. This is hard because then there's no governance structure that climate change falls under. If we think about the carbon that we're emitting here in Virginia, it's going to have impacts on people living in Texas and people living in Wyoming, to say nothing of people living in other countries as well. There's a positive flip to that, which is we also have more flexibility in addressing climate change in that we get benefits from net reduction. So to that same end, people in Texas, people in Wyoming, people in other countries benefit if we here in Virginia reduce our emissions. The other feature of greenhouse gas pollution that it's important to note is that greenhouse gases are persistent. And certainly there are many different types of greenhouse gases. We named several a few slides ago, and they all have different rates of assimilation into the environment. We talked about assimilation in our pollution lecture earlier, but just to remind everyone, is the rate at which pollutants are absorbed by the environment. And while all these greenhouse gases assimilate at different rates, they tend to be persistent. They tend to stick around, and as a result, we care about the stock of uh, accumulated greenhouse gases. From here, it's worth it to take a minute to consider both the sources, the emitting origins of these greenhouse gases, and the sinks. And we can think of a sink as sort of a negative emission, what soaks it all up. So on your minute, on your own, take a minute to, to think about what some of these sources and sinks are, 
and we can regroup on the next slide to discuss them a little bit. So in terms of sources, we can think of burning stuff as a main source of greenhouse gas emissions. Not just burning fossil fuels like oil and coal, but also burning wood, other carbon releases into the atmosphere. We can think of specifically methane release. This usually comes from an agricultural context, cows and land, but we also have methane released when permafrost melts, uh, when we have a natural gas leak, uh, landfills emit methane. Since so much methane comes from our agricultural processes, we can think of industrial processes more generally as being a source of greenhouse gas emissions. Factories, mining, manufacturing are all a major source of emitting greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. But we also have negative emissions. We have sinks, places that soak up some of these greenhouse gases. We all know about photosynthesis and respiration, the, the process by which plants take in carbon and, and release oxygen. Obviously this happens in the forest, but it happens in the oceans as well with plankton and algae. We talked about agriculture as a source of, of greenhouse gases from, from methane leaks and other industrial processes, but we can also think about agriculture as a sink for, for greenhouse gas emissions and some of the more sustainable farming practices. And to that end, we might develop new technology, new sequestration techniques, which for the most part is in pilot stages right now, but can help us absorb some of that ozone and some of that carbon out of the atmosphere. So with these in mind, it's worth revisiting what we said a few slides ago, that climate change will harm humans. So how will climate change harm humans? Well, first, let's caveat this by saying we are following the norm of being anthropocentric. The thing that we are using policy to try and improve are the net benefits that accrue to us as people. This might be problematic. It's consequentialist in that uh, we care less about process and more about outcomes. And it doesn't give any inherent weight to animals or nature, just us. But it helps us to simplify and, and streamline how we are thinking about impact. And to that end, we kind of have to think about a ladder where there are net emissions of greenhouse gases that we put out there. There are sources and there are sinks, but, but um, on balance, there is more being put out than being absorbed. There are net emissions. Now, reducing the sources or increasing the sinks is called mitigation or abatement. And this is going to reduce the physical impacts of climate change that occur. On top of that, as climate change impacts happen, people in communities will respond in, in behavioral ways uh, that's going to reduce the impacts that they feel. And this is called adaptation. But regardless, between all this mitigation, abatement, and adaptation, we're still going to see damages bad things happening to people. Which brings us back to that caveat that we are looking at anthropocentric effects of climate change. Still, that doesn't answer how humans are being impacted, how climate change will affect humans. And there are many ways. I'm going to list what I've come up with in a minute, but right now on your own, take some time to brainstorm how you think climate change will affect humans. So first, there's agricultural effects. And again, not all of these are bad. Some places are going to produce less agriculture. Some places are going to produce more. But in general, this impacts the food chain. And I'll provide one specific example of how it impacts the food chain, and that's with ocean-based fisheries. We're going to lose some species that are sensitive to, to when the oceans get more acidic. We're going to, as a result, have a change in the entire ecosystem. And like I said, that impacts the food chain. Speaking of this specific example of ocean fisheries, 
we might see property damage to, to coastal properties. This means we have less usable land because the sea level is rising and coastal properties are suspect or, or, or susceptible to storm surges, especially in low-lying areas. We're also going to see, as a result, damage to public and private infrastructures. We're going to see less available water for consumption. It's harder to desalinate when, when water is acidic. And as a result, we're going to see harmful effects to public health. Infectious diseases are going to spread, particularly in developing countries. We're also going to see people having, having health problems due to heat stress, due to increased allergens, and so forth. Invasive species will spread. We're going to see habit and ecosystem loss. And going back to the top, we're going to see changes in how the ocean circulates, which is going to have unknown effects. We don't fully know the damages here. Beyond that, it's important to note that these impacts are non-uniform, which means they're not evenly distributed. Some people are going to see stronger impacts. Some people are going to see more negative impacts. Some people might even benefit. But with these non-uniform impacts, with these uneven impacts, we're going to see different geographies, different income levels, people of different races influenced by climate change differently, and that in turn raises questions of equity and justice. So why are people arguing that we shouldn't do things against climate change? And before we get into these arguments, let's have this strong spoiler alert that the science of climate change is clear and well established. So many of these questions about why should we do something are posed in bad faith. But you'll often see people ask, are we as humanity causing atmospheric changes? Again, these questions are posed in bad faith. Yes, we are the ones causing the atmospheric changes. Can on causing the atmospheric changes, do changes to the atmosphere result in changes in climate? And again, this is a question posed in bad. The answer is clearly yes. This is not a climate science class. This is not an environmental science class. We're going to take these as given. But the difficult one, and the one where we can use environmental economics to answer it more generally, is even Given that we are causing these atmospheric changes, even given that these atmospheric changes are causing climate change, is it worth expending resources to fight it? And what I put here is probably, but, but, but more broadly, this is a much more difficult question to answer than the first two. Another way you might see this question posed is, is it too late to reverse the effects? So the way I think about it is when we do something that increase greenhouse gas emissions, that's going to make climate change worse, and that's an externality. It has effects on people other than me. It has non-market impacts. And we know from, from what we've talked about with the economics of the environment that when people do too much of something that generates an externality, some kind of regulation is necessary. I think that applies here with the environment where more regulation is necessary because of the, these externality generating processes. The other thing to think about is every year we're getting new and more information that uh, regarding climate change that it's moving more rapidly than expected. And we know that some places are flattening their emissions curves, but other places are growing their emissions. And we're not on the right trend we need to be on to avert major damage. So based on that first thing I said about government regulating externalities, and the second thing where we know we're not on the right damage aversion trend, we need serious regulation and we need to get there as soon as possible. This brings us to the last thing I want to talk about today, which is a brief history of climate change policy. And I'll, I'll note right off the bat that we're going to leave out the Paris Accords for now. But 
Since 1988, the UN has charged the IPCC to report every so often on the scientific consensus regarding climate change. And I'll, I'll point you back to, to those uh, previous slides. The scientific community is in consensus. Other questions about climate change tend to be posed in bad faith. Humans are causing atmospheric changes, and those atmospheric changes are exerting damage on the environment, severe damage. So what's the policy we've seen in response to that? Well, the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 committed many countries to stabilizing their greenhouse gas emissions and return to 1990 levels. It has flexible mechanisms built in to reduce costs. Um, but in the time since, most countries have accomplished very little. I said we'll leave out the Paris Accords in, in part because the extent to which they've taken effect is, is minimal right now, but people tend to be cautiously optimistic, not only because of the wide participation from the international community, but also because of the collective actions outside of this framework where regions and smaller countries and subnational governments are also making moves to reduce their emissions. What's a big sticking point on the role of climate change policy here? And this is the last thing we'll talk about today. So, so one sticking point is developing countries. And we're not going to debate this in detail right now, but on your own, take a minute to, to think about why this might be problematic. So many of these developing countries didn't create the existing stock of emissions. And remember, we're concerned with greenhouse gas stock because they're not as, greenhouse gases are not assimilated into the environment that easily. So many of these countries didn't create the existing stock of emissions, but are countries where we see the largest flow, the biggest increases now. This is in part because these developed countries who did create the existing stock have leveled off their emission increases. It's with an eye towards this flow, not stock, that China is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases right now. So this open question on the role for developing countries is basically posed as follows. Should developing countries be committed to be on a cleaner path of development? So on the one hand, they are the ones uh, we see the largest increases now in terms of flow. But on the other hand, is it fair? Remember, uh, the, the question beneath all these environmental economics questions is how are people harmed or, or helped? And are those harms and helps just and equal, just and equitable? So a country like the U.S., benefited immensely from the fact that it, it engaged in, in what we'll call dirty or brown development, right? The U.S. grew as a superpower without green technologies. And without these green technologies in our past, the U.S. has profited greatly. And the world as a whole is now paying the price. So the question when it comes to the role of developing countries in, in climate change policy is should they be committed to paying that price or are they entitled to develop without these green technologies as well? We'll address these, these questions in class next time. I'm looking forward to hearing what you all have to think.